Greetings, it's Paul with a script that illustrates a lot of the ideas about changing basis in an abstract vector space without forcing you to do all sorts of tedious arithmetic and algebra. First, let's get started on Lagrange interpolation. And let's deal with the vector space of polynomials whose degree is no greater than 2. Here are some examples. These form an abstract vector space of dimension 3 because the general polynomial a plus bx plus cx squared can be represented perfectly well in R by the vector made from a, b, and c. The obvious basis to introduce into this vector space is the function 1, the function x, the function x squared, and those are represented by three vectors that have a 1 in one position, a 0 in the other two positions. Now let's choose three evaluation points. I chose 1, negative 3, sorry, 1, 3, and 4. And having chosen those evaluation points, I can devise a new basis, which for some purposes is quite convenient. In this new basis, we're going to have three polynomial functions, w1, w2, and w3, and each of them will be chosen to have the value 1 at one evaluation point and 0 at the other two evaluation points. This basis is useful if we want to reconstruct a polynomial from its value at the three points x1, x2, and x3, because this polynomial is just the value at x1 times a function that's 1 only at x1 plus the value at x2 multiplied by the function that's 1 only at x2 plus something similar for x3. Furthermore, it's easy to express the old basis vectors in terms of the new ones. All we have to do is to evaluate at the three points. So v1, that's the constant function 1, must be the sum of the functions that are 1 at those three points, respectively. v2, on the other hand, is x1, that's the first evaluation point, times a function that's 1 there, plus x2 times the value of the function that's 1 there, x3. And for v3, we have to square, because we need to calculate x1 squared, x2 squared, and x3 squared to get the coefficient of the new basis functions. Since these express old basis vectors in terms of new, we'll call the matrix P inverse, and that's what it looked like. You'll see vectors like this in the Hubbard's textbook. And when students do the homework problems on this topic, they're forever asking, why does this matrix look the way it is? It's just the way to evaluate, and the way you construct it is for each column, you just take an evaluation point and raise it to the zeroth, first, second, etc. power. R is happy to invert a matrix. The function that you need to call is solve. So there's the inverse, and since P inverse express the old basis vectors in terms of the new. P must express the new basis vectors in terms of the old. For example, this second column means that the function that is 1 at the second evaluation point 3 and 0 at the other two evaluation points is 2 times minus 2 times the constant 1 plus 2.5 times the monomial x minus 0 0.5 times x squared. And I can check that by building such a function in R and evaluating it at the three points, getting 0, 1, and 0, respectively. Now, let's take these new basis vectors, represented by vectors in R, and turn them into honest-to-goodness functions. For example, running down the 
first column, I will take that entry plus this entry times x plus this entry times x squared. That's an honest-to-goodness polynomial function. I can ask R to plot it. I can draw horizontal lines at 0 and 1. I can draw some vertical lines. And on inspecting the graph, you can see this function does what we want. It's equal to 1 when x equals to 1. It's equal to 0 when x equals 3 or x equals 4. Now let me do the same with the second function and plot it in green. That has the value 0 at 1 and 4, but the value 1 at 3. And the third one has the value 0 at 1 and 3, but the value 1 at 4. And these three functions form a basis for the space of polynomials whose degree is no greater than 2. In other words, any quadratic polynomial can be made as a linear combination of these. So let's try making one given three specific values. The value at 1 is negative 1, at 3 it's 2, at 4 it's 1. How do I do that? I take minus 1 times the function that has the value 1 at 1, plus 2 times the function that has the value 1 at 3, plus 1 times the function that has the value 1 at 4. There it is in R. I can plot it and see if it came out correct. The value at uh, 1 is negative 1. The value at 3 is 2. The value at 4 is 1. Now let's make a Lagrange interpolation formula, interpolation formula. And for this, I'm just going to generate three random coefficients. So I have made a quadratic polynomial. Every time I run this script, it comes out differently. And the challenge I've set for myself is, given the values of this polynomial at 1, 3, and 4, I want to find the value at 2. Well, if I evaluate this polynomial at 1, 3, and 4, that gives me the three coefficients relative to the new basis. If I want the coefficients relative to the old basis, all I do is multiply by the change of basis matrix P, which I've already constructed, and when I look at that, I say these are coefficients relative to the old basis. In other words, a formula for this polynomial is 1.51 times 1 plus 1.414 times 2. I get back the polynomial coefficients that I generated earlier. And if I want to evaluate this at 2, I just multiply those coefficients of 1, x, and x squared by the values of 1, x, and x squared when x equals 2. And to check that I got it right, I evaluate the function itself at 2. Now I can go one step further. I can take the value of 2 raised to various powers, 1, 2, 2 squared, more dimensions I'd have, 2 cubed, and so on. And I can view this as a one-row matrix. I multiply by the coefficients relative to the old basis to do the evaluation, but we know that's p times the coefficients relative to the new basis. So there is a three-way matrix multiplication that gives the right answer, the value of this function at 2. But I can perfectly well do the multiplication on the left first. So I will multiply this row vector by p. That gives me a 1 by 3 matrix. And I've got it. A Lagrange interpolation formula. I matrix multiply that vector by the values at the points 1, 3, and 4. 
and it gives me the value at 2, and I did this without ever seeing the coefficients of the polynomial. This turns out to be quite important in computer graphics these days. It's a standard way of drawing smooth curves. Now let's try another example of change of basis. When you were learning integral calculus, you undoubtedly were forced to integrate functions like cosine squared x and perhaps even cosine to the fourth power of x. And the trick of doing that, as you may remember, is to rewrite those in terms of functions like cosine of 2x and cosine of 4x, because those functions are easy to integrate. The ones you're given are not. So this is another change of basis. We've got a three-dimensional vector space where the old basis is powers of the cosine function, and the new basis is cosine functions for multiple angles, 2x and 4x. To get the change of basis matrix P, we want to express the new basis vectors in terms of the old. Well, clearly 1 is 1. That's easy enough. For the second one, I have to express cosine 2x in terms of cosine squared x. The trig identity for that is quite well known, and I just put together the coefficients. If I view cosine of 4x as cosine of twice 2x, I can get a formula for the cosine of 4x. It's got three coefficients, 1, negative 8, and 8 relative to the old basis. And there we have it. Here's my change of basis matrix. I bind those three things together as the columns of a matrix. And here's the change of basis matrix that expresses the new basis vectors 1, cos 2x, and cos 4x in terms of powers. You have to look pretty hard on the internet in order to find the formulas that do it the other way, the formulas that express the powers of the cosine function in terms of cosines of multiple angles, but we can do it easily. We just invert that matrix. So here is P inverse. And what does the third column mean, for example? Well, it expresses the third vector in the old basis, that's cosine to the fourth of x, in terms of the vectors in the new basis, 3 eighths times 1, plus 4 eighths times cos 2x, plus 3 eighths plus 1 eighth, excuse me, times cosine 4x. And one way to check this is I graph cosine to the fourth from 0 to pi. That's what the graph looks like. And then for comparison, I graph the function expressed in terms of powers of cosine of 2x and 4x in a different color. One overwrites the other. These are two different formulas, but the same function. The whole reason that dealing with trigonometric functions is difficult and that students need to spend a lot of time studying so-called trigonometric identities is that this is a vector space that has many different bases and what you're learning when you learn trig identities is just change of basis formulas. Let me finish up by uh, getting some help from R in building a Gaussian integration rule. My goal is to invent a Gaussian integration rule which is exact on polynomials of degree up through degree 4. Well, I need to figure out how to evaluate a polynomial function if I specify the function by its vector of coefficients. What do I do? I take each coefficient and multiply by the appropriate power of the evaluation point x and sum up the results. So this function evaluates a polynomial. Let's check it. x2 represents the polynomial x squared. And I ask my function to evaluate it at 3. I get 9. 
if I ask it to evaluate x3, which represents x cubed, at 2, I get 8. Now on this abstract vector space, I can define an inner product. The inner product is multiply the polynomial functions together and then integrate the resulting product from minus 1 to 1. This satisfies the axioms for an inner product. And this is standard operating procedure in physics especially. This sort of thing is very, very important in quantum mechanics. So I need to write an R function that evaluates this inner product. It took me about half an hour to figure out how to do this, but once I got it right, it looks fairly easy. This is a function of v and w. v and w are just five component vectors in R. And uh, the rule is make a function of x by evaluating v at x, evaluating w at x, multiplying the resulting functions together. And you then integrate it. And what took me the half hour was figuring out that this function, for reasons I don't understand, does not come out vectorized. So I have to call vectorize with a capital V in order to get it to work. And since integrate returns not only the value of the integral, but an estimate of how large the error might be, I need dollar sign value. Let's check that this function works. The inner product of x0, the constant function 1 with itself, is 1 integrated from minus 1 to 1. That's 2. x1 is the function x. So that says integrate x squared from minus 1 to 1. That gives me 2 thirds. And starting with x squared, I integrate x fourth and get 2 fifths. So now we've reduced everything to abstract algebra. All we're working with is functions, is vectors of length 5. Let's introduce an orthonormal basis into this space. You learn how to do this in Math 23a. It's the infamous Gram-Schmidt process, a pain to do by hand, but kind of fun to do on a computer. The first thing I'm going to do is to turn x0 into a unit vector, which I do by dividing it by its own length, dividing it by the square root of its inner product with itself. Now we'll use Gram-Schmidt to continue making an orthonormal basis. I start with x2. That's the polynomial x squared. And I use the inner product to take the component along my first vector in the orthonormal basis. I multiply that component by the vector f0 itself. And I get a vector y2. That vector is indeed orthogonal to the vector v0, but it's not a unit vector. If I want it to be a unit vector, I simply divide it by the square root of its inner product with itself. And now I've got a vector of length 1. I do the same thing starting with x4. That's the polynomial x to the fourth. I subtract off from that the component along v0 times v0, and I also subtract off the component along v2 times v2. When I go to check this, I say, yes, indeed, the inner product with v0 is 0. The inner product with uh, v2 is 0. But this is far from a unit vector. I fix that by dividing the vector by its own length. And now I have three of the five vectors in my orthonormal basis. I do the same thing with x and x cubed. I won't bother to read the details. And I finally have an orthonormal basis in this abstract vector space. A partial check, if I look at the lengths of v3 and v4. They're both equal to 1. If I take a couple of inner products of different vectors, those inner products are always 0. 
Now, these five polynomials form a basis for the vector space. An integration rule that works for each of them works for any polynomial of degree 5, for any linear combination of the old basis vectors. But this is an orthonormal basis. One of the basis vectors is a constant, and therefore if I multiply any of these by v0 and integrate, I have to get 1. So that means when I integrate any of these things from minus 1 to 1, I have to get 0. That property has to persist in my Gaussian integration rule. Well, for v1 and v3, it's easy. I pick evaluation points that are symmetrically placed with respect to the origin and use the same weight for the positive and negative evaluation points. So I only have to worry about evaluating v1, v2, and v4. But I'm going to make it easy at v4. I'm only going to evaluate at the zeros of the polynomial v4, and therefore no matter what weights I choose, the evaluation rule is going to give zero. So there's my function v4 in a plottable form. That's what it looks like. And the places where it crosses the red line are the evaluation points. I looked up the coefficients on the internet. Since it just involves square roots, I'm sure the algebra is elementary, but I didn't want to do it. Here are the four evaluation points. There are vertical lines at the evaluation points. And you can see, yes, indeed, those are the four points where the function is 0. If I evaluate the function at those four points, I get 0. The weights I also looked up on the internet, here they are. And I'm just going to check that they are correct. For the constant function 1, the evaluation always gives 1. So these weights have to sum to 2 as I integrate from minus 1 to 1. They do. When I evaluate the integral of the function x squared using this rule, I have to multiply by the square of the evaluation point, one of the z's. And when I do that sum, I get 2 thirds. So this integration rule is right for x and x cubed because they're odd functions. It's correct for x to the fourth, or rather, correct for the uh, fourth, for the fifth basis vector, the one I made starting with x fourth, because I'm evaluating at the zeros of that function. And I just checked that it's correct for 1 and x squared. So let's check that it's valid for a random polynomial of degree 4. I've generated coefficients uniformly in minus 2 to 2 and created a function that evaluates a polynomial with those coefficients. That's what it looks like. Every time you run this script, of course, you get a different function and quite a different graph. I integrate it from minus 1 to 1. There's my answer. I use the Gaussian integration formula, taking weight times function at the evaluation point at those four points. I get exactly the same result, and this will work for any polynomial of this degree. Don't be fooled by this. These rules are great for polynomials. They are great for functions like sine and cosine that are well evaluated, well approximated by polynomials. Put in a single discontinuity in such a function is a disaster. So here is a function in R designed to be 1 when x is greater than negative 0 0.3 and 0 elsewhere. It took me about half an hour to figure out that while ordinarily I can use true as 1, in this case, R didn't like that. So I had to use as dot 
numeric to explicitly convert true and false to 1 and 0. There's a graph of this function. Doesn't take a Gaussian integration rule to integrate that one, does it? The integral is equal to 1.3 because it's equal to 1 for negative 0.3 up to 1. What does my wonderful Gaussian integration rule give me? It gives me 1. It's a total disaster. And that's why there's a lot of art that goes into designing really good numerical integration methods. Well, this turned out to be a rather long script. Let's hope YouTube will accept it.